So, everyone is talking about Haaland and Darwin Nunez, but hear me out for one second, we need to talk about Gabriel Jesus. He started out his career at blazing speed after an incredibly heartwarming childhood story, arriving in Europe after just two seasons and ever since then, he has been scoring at a rate that not many can compare to, and yet, he never really got the spotlight, with Guardiola often leaving him on the sidelines like a dusty old toy he no longer wants to play with. Looking back at his life so far, you can clearly clearly tell he's simply a bomb waiting to go off, and I believe Mikel Arteta might just be the man to light the fuse. Jesus could actually become the most dangerous man in the league, and so today I'm going to tell you every little detail of his life story and show you exactly why I think that. Let's go. When asked about his story, Gabriel Jesus started by saying, I was very, very lucky because along the way I met some superheroes. Don't laugh, it's real, I'll prove it to you. And Man, was he right. The first of those unknown heroes, as he likes to call them, was his mother. Before Gabriel had even left the womb, his father had already ran off with some other woman, and before he even had the chance to go looking for him, he had died in a motorcycle accident. But as he always said, my mom is both my mom and my dad. I never needed nobody else. Despite being so poor that the entire family slept on the same bed, she made sure there was always food on the table, which is saying a lot in Jardin Peri, a place where many kids only join football teams to get a free sandwich after training, most often their only meal of the day. Still, poverty ensured those kids valued football above all else. As Gabriel has said, they were little kid tournaments in town for which the biggest prize was literally a soda bottle, and once they won, sharing it between the team, that single sip each kid would have felt like winning the World Cup. And so, by the age of seven, Gabriel was already playing among all the 15 year olds in his street. As he said it himself, I had to learn how to take a hit. Something he probably learned from his mom as well, would often help him practice, he has even called her the toughest center back he ever faced. Still, she did worry a lot, constantly calling him to check on his well-being, which eventually led to his famous celebration. At the age of nine, he met the second of those superheroes, a man named Mamed, his first ever coach. Gabriel and his friend had heard of a team that played in the middle of a forest in a pitch made for a military prison, and they went looking for it. What they found changed their lives forever. Mamed welcomed them as if they were his own kids, helping fill the void Gabriel's father had left. With his beat-up old beetle, every day he would bring the kids to the pitch, sometimes up to eleven in the same car. He gave them food, he gave them boots, anything he could get to give them a real chance at life. The kids were so grateful they would train extra hard to make Mamed proud. As Gabriel once said, you've probably never heard of our team, but I have to say, they make miracles happen back there. He stayed with them from 9 to 13 years old, he started as a midfielder and moved to striker, trying to be more like Ronaldo, ironically the player he would go on to be compared the most. His talent would grow rapidly, as Mamed said in an interview, already back then it seemed he was always in the right place at the right time. It seems as if the ball looks for him, he never looks for the ball. In fact, he made it all seem so easy that he eventually was nicknamed Titinha, from a Brazilian expression meaning too easy. The day his life finally began to change, he was playing a local tournament. They weren't even supposed to have a real chance against the bigger teams, but every game they would not just beat them, they would humiliate them. 12-0, 13-0, all sorts of wild scoreboards were seen. Eventually, they made the final. They had to face Portuguesa. They were no joke, a first division club, a whole other level. Still, the kids were confident, but then came a storm so bad the match was nearly cancelled and when it kicked off, the pitch was as muddy as ever. That meant nothing to the other team playing with iron studs, but Gabriel and his teammates were playing without proper cleats, were slipping and falling all over the place. It just wasn't fair. They would lose 4-2 to two, and that moment would be imprinted in Gabriel's mind forever. He now knew that no matter if things aren't fair, you always have to find a way, and he did. Just a year later, he turned 14, the age at which most Brazilian kids begin working to help their family, but instead, his mom made sure he kept following his dream. To do that, he began playing everywhere, trying to get as many eyeballs on him as he could. First, he joined his local football tournaments, known for being the most aggressive football you can imagine. The first time he entered the pitch, they said, a kid is going to play? 
10 minutes and he's dead. Regardless, with his first touch of the ball, he dribbled past their best defender and scored his first goal. So, they made his life living hell. Every time he touched the ball, they would hit him as hard as they could. A player would even tell him, if you dribble past me again, I'll break your legs. Of course, he never stopped and by the end, the same player would threaten that he would break his legs in the parking lot. As Gabriel would go on to say, if it weren't for my teammates keeping me safe, I don't know what could have happened. Regardless, at least he was safer there than on the streets. Over the years, Coach Mamed had to attend three different funerals for three different kids who got lost in the streets and one day just didn't show up for their ride. Alongside these tournaments, Gabriel also joined the new youth club Anhanguera and he was incredible, finishing as the top scorer of the São Paulo Under-15 Cup with 29 goals, a performance that impressed every club in town, with Gabriel going from trial to trial, from Portuguesa to Corinthians and then São Paulo, always refusing every offer as he couldn't travel that far for training. But then came Palmeiras, who offered him a trial after watching him for only 10 minutes and then a contract after a single training session. Still, he never stopped playing at those tournaments. They paid him 100 reais per game, the only money he made besides a few bucks from doing deliveries and helping in a local market. He still felt he owed his mom much more. Regardless, at first things didn't go very smoothly at Palmeiras. His first coach wanted him to play two-touch football and Gabriel struggled with that so much that at one point he was nearly sent home. But thankfully, the coach of the under-18 saw what a mistake this was and instead bumped him up to his squad. The odds of success were slim, now playing with kids two years older than him, but instead he completely took off, surprisingly even finishing the year as the team's top scorer. This prompted a rise like very few, eventually going on to finish the Under-17 Paulista Championship with 37 goals in 22 matches, which added to an immense performance in the Under-18 São Paulo Cup, being named the player of the tournament despite not even making the final stage, finally allowed them to debut for the main team and the result was mind-blowing. It seemed from the moment he joined, the mood changed. By the end of the first season, Palmeiras had won the Brazilian Cup, had made the final of the Paulista Championship and were now up to ninth place in the league. Instantly, Jesus had become a local hero and as crazy as it seems, even the guy who had threatened to break his legs would meet him one day and tell him, I can't believe I was actually going to do that to you. I love you now. You're saving my team. Thank God I didn't do it. As odd as it was, Gabriel just left it off. I guess you gotta see the positive side of things. Over summer, he also joined the under-20 national team and they nearly made history, losing the final of the World Cup to Serbia. Regardless, in 2016, his career changed forever. His year started really well with Palmeiras and then he was called up to the Olympic Games, where he scored three goals and became a key figure as Brazil went on to conquer the only trophy they were yet to win. Just two years earlier, he was painting the streets in yellow and green in honor of the national heroes. Now, he was one of them and the good times weren't ending anytime soon. With Jesus finishing off the season by taking the Brazilian championship by storm, eventually winning the Golden Ball Award for the best player of the year and taking Palmeiras to the title of Brazilian champions only two years after being promoted and 22 years since the last time it had happened. At 19, he was already a legend and rightfully so, the offers began pouring in, with Jesus eventually joining Man City for 32 million euros, looking to be coach by Pep Guardiola. But before moving, he had one final thing to do in Brazil. He went to the store and bought 250 pairs of high-quality boots, took them in his car and delivered them to Pequeninos, his old football club, so that no other kid would ever feel that sense of injustice that had bothered him so much growing up. Arriving in January in the middle of the season, coming off of a World Cup qualification stage where he had been involved in 9 goals in 6 matches, with City struggling in 5th place and Gabriel being talked up to be the successor of Sergio Aguero, that was a lot of pressure to put on the shoulders of a teenager, but still, he outperformed all of the expectations, scoring 3 goals and getting 2 assists right on his first 3 starts. But that was exactly when he broke his foot, spending 3 months on the sidelines. Regardless, as he came back he played even better, finishing off the season by stealing the role of main striker from Aguero himself and going on 5 starts with 4 goals and 3 assists, taking City to a 3rd place finish, ensuring they qualified to the Champions League and finishing the season with a goal involvement every 59 minutes, which is clearly out of this world. 
Still, the next season, after a few changes to the squad, Guardiola began playing Jesus and Agüero side by side, which brought down his numbers a bit, especially as another long-term injury sent him on a dry spell lasting nearly four months. Despite all of that, by the end, not only had they won the league and the League Cup, Jesus totaled around one goal involvement every 117 minutes in what was his first full season in the Premier League. Unfortunately, over summer there would be no silver lining to his World Cup performance, where despite having incredible numbers during qualification and lots of hype for his debut with a huge graffiti being put up in his hometown, he went on to not score a single goal despite starting every game of the final stage, eventually even being seen crying on the bench. Though, to be fair he was being tasked with living up to the great Brazilian number 9 shirt, despite being the youngest member of the squad. Nonetheless, the following season he bounced back tremendously, winning all four domestic trophies and being absolutely keen the cup competitions where he scored and assisted at a ridiculous high rate, getting a goal contribution every 68 minutes. Though it should be noted, he was no slouch in the Premier League or Champions League either, with a goal contribution every 99 minutes. And alongside all of that, he would join Brazil for the 2019 Copa America, assisting one goal and scoring the other in a 2-0 semi-final win against Argentina, and then getting another goal and assist in the final versus Peru to take his first ever international trophy. But just as this was clearing up the reactionary rumors that Gabriel was not fit to wear the Brazilian number 9, he went two years without scoring, becoming an absolute joke at the eyes of many Brazilians. Though some blame national team coach Tite instead, considering that his underperformance is only a result of him moving Jesus to the right wing, which seems to bear some truth considering he scored 63% less goals from the wing across his entire national team career. This whole slump was especially odd considering that in 2019 he would play his best ever season for City, getting more game time than ever and going on to score 23 goals and total 14 assists across 53 games, being especially impressive in the Champions League where he scored a hat-trick against Zagreb and scored two unassisted ones to knock out Real Madrid before a shocking exit to Lyon. Despite his peak in performance, he started the following season with three different injuries being sort of pushed out of the team for a while, leading his form to drop as he scored less frequently than he ever did, going on to play a disastrous Copa America over summer with no goals and a two-game suspension that ensured he watched from the stands as Brazil choked the final versus their rivals Argentina. After one more season where he failed to get much game time despite bouncing back to his usual goal-scoring form, even scoring a Premier League poker in another goal against Real Madrid, Gabriel began carefully plotting his next career move, eventually settling on a transfer to Arsenal for 52 million euros, joining his former secondary coach Mikel Arteta, as he says he believes in Arsenal's project and wants to be at a club where he can get more game time and get more responsibility. However, the question is, will he finally hit his prime at Arsenal? Can he even compete with top goal scorers like Haaland, Salah, Ronaldo and Son? Well, let me just tell you this, across his entire Premier League career, he has scored or assisted every 101 minutes. In the Champions League, he's even better, one every 88 minutes, being already on 20 goals, that's more than Aubameyang, Lukaku, Kane and Son. If you want to stretch that even further, it's only 7 less than Suarez managed in his entire career and more than even his idol Ronaldo scored. He's incredibly hardworking, level-headed and the kind of person who never forgets his roots, is versatile, good on the ball, great at finding space and one of the greatest pressing strikers available today. Looking at some more in-depth stats, you can see his shot quality is through the roof, that he is great at creating chances for others, even outperforming his expected assists by far, with the only downside being a tendency to underperform his expected goals. This, added to the fact that I'm sure Arteta will be more focused on Gabriel than Pep ever was, I expect not only his qualities to be put on display like never before, but also for his weaknesses and rough edges to be smoothed out, hopefully exposing an incredible talent who just hasn't been given the spotlight he deserves.